Last year, the Ministry of Power and Energy decided to award the construction and operation of a major wind power project to a company called Adani Green Energy Sri Lanka Limited. Adani will construct 52 wind turbines on the island of Manar, each with a generation capacity of 5.2 megawatts. The project will generate about 1,000 gigawatt hours of green energy every year. That's about 6% of Sri Lanka's current national demand. Sounds great, doesn't it? Well, it isn't. The sad fact is that this is yet another one of those wasteful scam projects that have reduced this country to destitution. The environmental impact assessment of this project was concluded recently and open for public comment. The assessment itself is an absolute disgrace. It reminded me of the medical certificate issued recently by Joe Biden's doctor that he is fit to serve as president, even while we can all see that he is in really quite bad shape. The EIA for Adani's Mana Wind Power Project amounts to little more than a sham, a rubber stamp, a whitewash. It overlooks the enormous social, economic and environmental harm that this project will cause. These 52 gigantic turbines, each one 220 meters tall, these will be the third highest structures in Sri Lanka and they'll be located in the heart of Mana Island, which is one of the most important bird areas in the world. Millions of birds, more than 120 species from across the Northern Hemisphere, some of them from as far away as the Arctic Circle, migrate southwards to Manor every winter. It is primarily for that reason that the island is surrounded by protected areas like Adams Bridge Marine National Park, Madhu National Park, the Vankale Sanctuary, Giant Stank Sanctuary, and the Wadatthalthivu Nature Reserve. In fact, the Ministry of Environment has declared the entire region an environmentally sensitive area. Wankalai is even recognized as a wetland of international importance under the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands. And we know that wind turbines kill hundreds of thousands of birds every year. What is the point of the grand language of our constitution, which says that the state shall protect, preserve and improve the environment for the benefit of the community? when that very state paves the way to destroy the environment. The claim that manna is a unique bird habitat is not just green speak. It is based on solid evidence. At the forefront of gathering this evidence has been Professor Sampat Seneviratna of the University of Colombo. Over the past several years, his team has spent thousands of hours taking censuses of birds in the manna region. They've accumulated reams of valuable data and they've put it all in the public domain. Not just that, but they've fixed tiny satellite transmitters to the birds and tracked their movements across the world. They know precisely how and when birds migrate and which routes they use. And the region in which Adani plans to plant its 52 turbines is by far the busiest bird flyway, not just in Sri Lanka, but in South Asia. And even though all this data is freely available to the public, the Environmental Impact Assessment completely ignores it. Not just that, but they conducted their bird census in manner visually, and therefore entirely during daytime. Whereas we know from the satellite tracking data and from the scientific literature that migratory birds fly predominantly at night. In 2016, despite warnings that high-tension power lines across bird corridors kill birds, the CEB, aided, abetted and funded by the Asian Development Bank, decided to erect 220 kilovolt high-tension overhead transmission lines across the Vankalai Sanctuary. There again, several scientists, including myself, warned of the harm to birds and the unique wetland habitat. I met personally with both the CEB and the ADB to plead for safe underground cable systems rather than overhead high-tension cables. For its part, the Central Environment Authority, as it almost always does, sided with the project developer and the overhead cables were approved. Since then, these cables have been killing threatened species of birds by the hundred. Here you see flamingos and brahmini kites electrocuted by these cables. The irony is that these birds are strictly protected by the Fauna and Flora Protection Ordinance. Killing one of them could land you in prison for five years. Yet the CEB kills them by the hundred and no one is held to account. 
the Central Environmental Authority has reduced the entire environmental impact assessment process to a farce. To add to the irony, the Asian Development Bank labeled this a green power project. We should have known then that when the ADB says a project is green, it would instead be red, saturated with the blood of countless birds. In a speech in Parliament last week, Sajid Premadasa drew attention to the numerous flaws in the Adani EIA. He also referred to the excessive price the CEB would be paying for this power. Have a listen. Parisara Vartava, Anivar in Magaim Vartava, Dosha Sahitai, Eke Barapatala, Unataven, Vishamataven Tibena, E. Piaputi Tulin, Maha Adikamila Kata, Apita Vidri Labagan and Sidunak in a Karna, Tiripatala Tibena. No one knows just how much the government is planning on paying Adani for the electricity generated by this facility. That seems to be a state secret for some reason. So far as I am aware, the power purchase agreement for this project hasn't yet been published. But of course, we can be sure that a price has been negotiated. Without that, it's inconceivable that Adani would have embarked on an EIA in the first place. Why would they? What we do know from the EIA itself is that the government has committed to buy power from Adani for the next 25 years, the next quarter century. The EIA claims that the price we will pay Adani will be either 4 US cents per kilowatt hour or 4.6 US cents per kilowatt hour. It mentions both those figures, and there's good reason to believe that, as with so much else in the EIA, both those figures are just nonsense. Meanwhile, Economy Next, a usually reliable news outlet, reported Energy Minister Kanchana Vijayasekara saying a few days ago that while Adani was demanding 9.7 US cents per kilowatt hour, that's to say about 30 rupees per unit, he had negotiated them down to below 30 rupees, whatever that means. Now here's the rub. According to the United States Department of Energy, the going rate for wind energy is now down to, get this, less than two cents, less than six rupees per kilowatt hour. This means that the price we're looking at paying Adani for this wind energy is almost five times, 500% the market price. And I haven't even got to the worst part yet. It seems to have missed even Sajid. The wind energy in Manor, or for that matter, anywhere else in Sri Lanka, is a national natural resource, just like our hydropower. It belongs to you and to me, the citizens of this country. How is it then that our government invites a foreigner to come and harvest this resource and then sell it back to us, not even in rupees, but in US dollars? Just think about that. Isn't it crazy? It's our country. It's our wind. And now we get to pay for it in foreign currency? For the next 25 years? You've got to be kidding me. With politicians like these, are you surprised that Sri Lanka is bankrupt? Not convinced? Let's do the math. According to the EIA, the CEB will buy 990 gigawatt hours of wind energy from Adani's wind power system in Manor every year. According to Economy Next, we will be paying Adani around 9.5 US cents per kilowatt hour. Multiply those and you soon see that we will be paying Adani around $94 million every year in foreign currency. So over the contract period of 25 years, we will be paying out, or to be more accurate, our children will be paying out, a staggering 2.35 billion US dollars to the Adanis. Now compare that with those so-called wasteful projects we talked about a little while ago. You can see that when you add them all up, they total just $1.8 billion. But that's only 76% of our projected payout to Adani. Signing up to this deal will mean that the state will lose as much money as it did in the famous bond scam of 2015. Remember that? Every month for the next 25 years. A bond scam equivalent every month. You couldn't make this up. The government might claim that the Adani venture represents much-needed FDI, foreign direct investment. This is a nonsensical argument. 
There are any number of Sri Lankan companies whose market capitalization far exceeds the $144 million of equity that Adani says it will invest in this project. Haley's, LOLC, Dialogue, Expo Lanka, John Keels, Carson's, the list goes on. I suspect an IPO would sell out in minutes, especially given the return of investment of hundreds of percent that's been promised to the Adanis. And that way, we pay in rupees and to Sri Lankan companies, to Sri Lankan shareholders who pay Sri Lankan taxes, unlike the Adanis. And one last point. In his parliamentary address, Sajid Premadasa repeatedly asked the Minister of Environment to consult Professor Sampat Seniviratna with regard to the flaws in the EIA. I was disappointed that the opposition leader omitted any mention of Professor Devaka Virakor, also of the University of Colombo, who has worked for years on the biodiversity of Mana. It was Professor Virakorn, after all, who warned presciently just two years ago, and I quote, that large-scale development projects, ongoing as well as planned, such as wind energy development in Mana Island and the mainland, are likely to pose a threat to critical species and habitats that are present in the district of Mana. Indeed, as far back as 2017, Professor Virakorn had warned, again presciently, that the winter habitats of migratory species should be conservation priorities, adding that a good example of migratory species habitats are the wetlands of Manau. So fragile does Professor Virakorn consider the bird habitats of Manau to be that he has even recommended restricting the number of bird watchers allowed on the island at any one time. Only a maximum of 500 visitors can be accommodated in Mana Island at a given time for bird watching, he writes. Visitors for bird watching should be restricted. Now, who amongst you will argue that 52 gigantic wind turbines will do less harm to the environment than 500 nature loving bird watchers armed only with their binoculars? It is tragic then that the Central Environmental Authority doesn't seem to have sought Professor Virakon's advice or even to have read his scientific publications. So what can we do? To its credit, the Wildlife and Nature Protection Society has made comprehensive representations to the CEA, asking them to revisit the EIA from scratch. It is fatally flawed and should, as it now stands, at least in my opinion, be rejected without further consideration. It is rubbish. If the CEA doesn't do that, I suspect some of us will take it upon ourselves to litigate, but only if the people of Mana want us to. After all, they are the principal losers in this game. In addition to having their landscape messed up, it is they who must suffer the noise and endless flicker from these turbines. What's more, they lose any prospect of tourism development in their island for the next several decades. 52 turbines, each as tall as the Altair Towers in Colombo, are unlikely to attract many tourists. I don't want to leave you with the impression that I'm somehow opposed to wind power. I'm not. Indeed, I'm all for it, and I think Sri Lanka should aim to get at least a quarter of its electricity from the wind by 2050. And I get it that Mana is an excellent site at which to generate wind energy. Although there are many inland areas that are windier, Hauling the 250-foot-long blades of these massive turbines along our narrow and winding roads is a logistical nightmare. For that reason, industrial-scale wind power is, at least for now, practical only in the coastal areas of Sri Lanka, so that the blades can be offloaded from barges. But it's crazy to do this on Mana Island, which is arguably the most environmentally sensitive part of Sri Lanka's entire coastline. In May of 2021, within days of Gotabe Rajapaksa announcing his ignorant and stupid prohibition of modern agriculture in the name of the organic revolution advocated by Dr. Anirudh Padenia, the president of the Government Medical Officers Association, yeah, remember him? I released a 72-minute video rebutting the new policy point by point. I warned that this would lead to economic chaos and agricultural collapse. Although more than 100,000 people watched that lecture, it wasn't enough to change Gotabe Rajapaksa's mind. 
such as it was. A year later, as you know too well, my darkest apprehensions came to pass. Our economy collapsed and it will not recover for at least another generation. Well, here I am again, telling you this time that yet another disaster awaits us if we fall into the trap that Mr. Adani and our political leadership have so craftily set for us. Beware.